open the pod bay doors, though. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. What would you do with a brain if you had one? Do? Why, if I had a brain, I could... Miles per hour. I could while away. 46, 56 degrees. So thank you very much for coming tonight. I know it's bad out there. I just want to say congratulations to all of you for still being alive, all right? Couldn't be easy getting here given the number of zombies that are out there right now. I actually came all the way from Williamstown. It took me three weeks to get here, three grueling weeks. Started with a band of seven. Now we're down to three, all right? I lost my dog. I lost my best friend, actually, my very best friend in the world. You know how long we've been best friends? Two weeks. Two weeks. This whole thing has kind of changed the nature of relationships, hasn't it? But it was well worth the trip, because I am going to tell you how to survive the zombie apocalypse. Okay? And the number of lives lost on my trip out here will be easily offset by the number of lives that we save here tonight. Now, we are currently living through the most horrific period in the history of humankind. Suddenly, Kim Kardashian doesn't seem so important anymore, does she? She's gone, by the way, in case you were wondering. <clears throat> now, there aren't a lot of us left, okay? This room actually contains most of the living humans in the city of Boston, as it turns out. Okay, and it's been hard for all of us. Me, I used, to be, I used to be a professor of mathematics at Williams College. But of course, when the zombie hordes descended on the college, it disappeared. So much for tenure. <laughs> and all of the other institutions disappeared as well. So there's no police anymore, there's no fire departments, there's no super stop and shop, there's no cappuccino lattes, there's no organic kale. There is no kale of any kind anymore. Some people are in favor of that, okay. And this building we're sitting in right now, this building used to be a movie theater. Do you remember movie theaters back in the day? Movie theaters where you would pay money and come to see a movie, and sometimes those movies would have zombies in them? How ironic is that? Now, I'm going to tell you how to survive the zombie apocalypse. And some of you may be sitting there saying to yourselves, well, why should we listen to you? What makes you an expert? But the truth of the matter is that I am, in fact, I was, in fact, the advisor on zombie affairs to the president of the United States, none other than Donald J. Trump. I was his advisor until uh, he was eaten by Sarah Sanders. <laughs> All right, so I want to start with some basic misconceptions about zombies. So let's start with some examples of misconceptions about zombies. Number one, they are the dead that have risen. In fact, that's not the case. All right, what actually happens is the virus that causes the zombies, which was actually started in a lab at Harvard by mistake, <laughs> that, that virus attacks your brain, much as the rabies virus attack, attacks your brain, only much quicker. And what it does is it liquefies most of the brain, and it only leaves the basic functions remaining, the ability to breathe, the ability to walk, and a hunger, a gnawing hunger. Number two, zombies can live forever, forever without sustenance. Now, this also is not true, because zombies really are living creatures, and no living creature can live without sustenance. If it were true that zombies can live without sustenance, then we'd get a gym, we'd put a bunch of treadmills on the gym, we'd put zombies on the treadmills, we'd chain them up, we'd put somebody sitting in front of them, and those zombies would actually power generators that would give enough electricity for the entire town of Brookline, okay? Or at least what's left of it. All right? So no, zombies actually need sustenance. It doesn't work without sustenance. Number three, zombies can be cured. That is not true. 
As I said, the virus liquefies your brain or most of your brain and you cannot cure someone who becomes a zombie. Now, of course, that's hard for people. If your mother turns out to be a zombie and the mother is coming towards you, you want to figure out a way to save your mother. And your mother is the person who sang you lullabies and who, who gave you baths and they come towards you and you just think, maybe there's some chance. And your mother leans into what you believe is a kiss. Game over, all right? <laughs> You cannot allow yourself that moment. Zombies cannot be cured. There are the people, the, the zombie advocates, save the zombies. Those people are gone now, okay? They shouldn't have opened up membership to the zombies. All right, so now, how to survive? How do you survive the zombie apocalypse? Let's talk about some basic things you need to do. Number one, wear protective gear. You'll notice I'm wearing one of the best things on earth is plastic. Plastic is something they can't chew through. Now I'm a little nervous because I don't see a lot of people wearing gear here, all right? I think that coat would work well. Okay, that'll keep them out, that's good. You guys need to get some more gear, maybe under your clothes you have something, I'm not sure, but I'll take it, I'll assume that maybe you do. Number two, the worst thing you can have, and I see some people here with it, is avoid long hair, okay? Long hair is deadly. If a zombie gets hold of your hair, you're dead. Now I happen, to have two, just two, bath caps here, okay? <laughs> Long hair, who would like a bath cap? <laughs> okay, so avoid long hair. Now number three, and this is the one I'm really gonna focus on, Zombies are stupid, okay? This is an incredibly useful fact, and I'm sorry, I know that sounds insulting to zombies, but you're allowed to insult zombies, okay? <laughs> zombies are stupid, and what I mean by that is I mean they are, they are not very smart. They're not as smart as a dog, okay? A dog can be taught to fetch. A dog can be taught to roll over. There's a very nice paper called Do Dogs Know Calculus, okay? And this is a paper written by Tim Pennings and it appeared in the College Mathematics Journal and this is his dog, Elvis. And Elvis loved to fetch a dog in the water. And Tim lived near Lake Superior and so Tim would stand on the shoreline and he would throw his ball in for the dog, okay? So here's where the ball goes, he'd throw the ball in the water. The dog, Elvis, would run along the shore and then at some point jump into the water and swim to get the ball. And of course, the dog's goal is to get there as soon as possible. Now, Elvis could run at 6.2 meters per second and swim at .98 meters per second. And so you can use calculus to figure out where is the optimal point that that dog should jump in to minimize the amount of time it takes to get to the ball. And remarkably enough, Elvis seemed to, it's as if he knew calculus, he seemed to be able to get to that point every time. It's very effective, okay? So now, what happens if we try the same thing with a zombie, all right? So, of course, it's not gonna work to throw a ball in the water. So instead, we're gonna throw in Harvey Weinstein, okay? <laughs> And now here's the zombie. What is the zombie gonna do? The zombie can walk at a certain speed and swim at a cer certain speed. The zombie doesn't care. The zombie's not smart enough to stay on the shore. The zombie always goes straight for Harvey Weinstein every <laughs> single time, okay? So I wanna get across this idea about zombies. So I'm gonna show you a little clip to get across the idea that zombies always are gonna head straight for you. Typical, typical zombie behavior. Instead of running across the front and up the stairs like any rational human being would do, they don't have the brains in their head to do it that way. Instead, they have to come straight for me, straight up the chairs. It's gonna take them a half hour to get here. All right, well, we better get going. So let's talk about 
about this a little more. Here is a zombie, and they are chasing the dean of the faculty, and the dean of the faculty is trying to make it to Sleason Hall, and the dean of the faculty is going in a straight line. And the zombie is always heading straight for where the dean is. The zombie isn't smart enough to try to cut off the dean and head, it off, head the dean off before the dean can make it to Sleason Hall. So if we let it go, what happens is the dean's going along, the zombie's moving faster than the dean, but the dean makes it to Sleason Hall. So we're going to watch this live now. So here you see the zombie's always headed for the dean. The dean's making a run for the hall. And the dean just barely makes it to the safety of Sleason Hall because the zombie's not smart enough to try to cut off the dean. Now you can actually model the path of the zombie, and this is the equation that you use. <laughs> And it turns out that you can actually tell exactly where the capture is going to occur, given by this equation here, which depends on the speed of the dean over the speed of the zombie. And you can figure out exactly where capture is going to occur. In this particular case, capture occurs after the dean has made it to safety. So the dean is safe in that particular case. I do have to point out, unfortunately, Sleason Hall was filled with zombies when he got there. And I hate to admit how much pleasure this gives me but the dean didn't make it. <laughs> okay, so now let's talk about circle pursuit. So circle pursuit is something where I have a circle and I'm gonna be moving around a circle. I'm, I'm. Uh, Beth, I thought, I thought this was a zombie safe zone. Folks, I'm really sorry about this. We really thought we didn't have to worry about any zombies here. I feel really bad about this, but it will give me an opportunity to demonstrate how to take down a zombie, all right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take care of this zombie. The trick is you hit with the bat behind the knee, causing the knee to buckle, all right? So I'm gonna demonstrate this right now, if you don't mind. Come on. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. So now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to ride a bike in a circle, and this zombie is going to chase me, and I want to see what's going to happen to the zombie when we ride that bike in a circle. All right? So these are the equations that dictate the motion. I'm not going to talk about the equations at all. It turns out you can't solve these equations, so you can only numerically approximate the result. But these are the equations that describe that motion. So let's watch what happens. So I'm riding in a circle. Here's a zombie that's chasing me. And you'll notice that the zombie starts heading towards that red circle. All right, let's try it again. So I started at a different point. And again, I'm riding my bike in a circle, and the zombie is chasing me. And it always ends up on that red circle. So in fact, if you start at any point, so here I'm starting at a point Z and I go around, it'll also end up at that circle. If I start at this point, it'll also end up at that circle, okay? Um, this is what we call a limit cycle, and if I start the zombie on the limit cycle, it'll just stay on the limit cycle, all right? Now it is true that I have to be moving a little bit faster than the zombie for this to be true, but it'll always happen that way. In fact, What's happening is the vector that points in the direction of motion called the tangent vector or the velocity vector always points towards me as we go around. So now let's see what happens if we have three different zombies. They're all chasing me. And you'll notice they all clump together. Now you can use this to your advantage as this next video shows. So these are two students trying to escape from zombies. They're hiding under the picnic table. Here come the zombies. So I'm going to ride my bike and see if I can help them. So let's see what we can do here. Uh, of course, uh, safety first. All right, I'm going to try to attract the zombies to me. Here we go. Wish me luck. Let's see what happens. All right, you zombies! Hey, follow me! Come on, you zombies! On the bottom right. Follow me over here! Come on, you're not so smart anymore. You used to be academics. You're not anymore, are you? That's good. Good zombies. Come on! Working like a charm. Nothing like an afternoon bike ride with a bunch of zombies behind you in a pack. 
I'm riding in a big circle around the quad right now. So you notice they're starting to follow me. They're starting to group together. And the idea is that the zombies are always going to head towards where I am. And what that means is their tangent vectors are always pointed straight at me. Now, because of that, it turns out that no matter where they start, they end up actually grouping in a clump. And they end up following me on a circle that has a smaller radius than my circle. So my circle's bigger than theirs because I'm riding faster than they're moving. But I end up getting all of them to follow me. So eventually, they'll be all together, in which case these people can escape. All right, the zombies are following me. OK, you folks, I think you're clear. You can get out of there and get to safety as quickly as possible. All right, looks like they're good. All right. <laughs> so, thank you. Come on, you zombies. So now let's talk about the long-term prognosis. All right, what's going to happen in the long term? And let's let h of t be the number of humans at time t. And let's let z of t be the number of zombies at time t. And then I want to look at the change in these things. So dh dt, the derivative, is the rate of change in the number of humans. And dz dt is the rate of change in the number of zombies. All right? And we want to try to understand what's going to happen in the long term. So initially in the short term, zombies have unlimited resources. In other words, we are that resource. And all they have to do is to bite us to get more zombies. And so you see exponential growth in the number of infected individuals. All right, so initially that's what happens. But eventually, so many people have been turned into zombies that there aren't that many left to turn into zombies. And then the resources start to run out, and we get what is called logistic growth. It starts to plateau, OK? So this is what happens initially. But now we want to talk about the very long term. And in the very long term, we have these two so-called differential equations that govern what's going to happen to these two groups that depend on how many human and zombie interactions there are, how many humans there are, how many zombies there are. When you figure out what's going to happen, I'm looking at this. This is the number of humans, h, on this axis, the number of zombies on this axis. So this point is when the, when the um, original infection occurs, the number of zombies is low and the number of humans is high. So then the number of zombies starts increasing, which means I'm moving in this direction. But eventually, if the number of humans starts to drop, then the number of zombies is high and the number of humans is low. Those zombies need humans to eat. Otherwise, they'll die off. And so then they start to die off. And then suddenly, both the zombies and humans are low, so the humans can make a comeback. And you can just keep cycling around this thing again and again and again. So what you get is a pattern that looks something like this. As time progresses, initially there's a lot of humans, very few zombies. The number of zombies increases, causing the number of humans to go down. Then the number of zombies goes down because they don't have humans to eat or turn into, in, into zombies. And therefore, the number of humans can recover. Then the number of zombies goes back up. And we're in this constant cycle, up and down and up and down. Now, this actually happens not just in the context of zombies. A very famous example is Isle Royale National Park, which is in Lake Superior. And this particular island, it's just an island there, in about 1900, a bunch of moose swam over to the island and established a colony of moose. And then, one cold winter, there was an ice bridge, and two wolves crossed over to the island. So we have a closed system that involves wolves, and it involves moose. And the wolves like to eat the moose. And so what has happened over time is you see these cycles in the number of wolves and the number of moose, where the number of wolves will go up high, and then the number of moose will drop, and then the number of wolves will go down, and then the number of moose will go back up. And you see these cycles going back and forth. You actually see this phenomenon occurring in a real life situation. This is what's called a predator-prey model. What do I mean? Oh, this is a real life situation. <laughs> yes, sorry. All right, so, um, so I want to thank you for uh, listening. I would like you to be safe. I want you to watch your back. I, I, I want you to, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, I think he's, he wasn't dead. I thought he was dead. I'm, I'm very sorry. Hang on just a second. OK, OK. Down you go. Down you go. Um, I'm afraid I, I have been beaten. <laughs> uh, is there someone?
someone who can beat me to death with a bat. 